if they should not be stored as plain text, should they be stored as MD5, SHA-1? And you might be saying, hey, Chris, no, 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 MD5, hell no. I mean, we got collisions. Even Google, Google said we got collisions now with SHA-1. They've been deprecated. We should not be using SHA-1 as password storage. And you might be inclined to say, well, what about uh, SHA-512? What about something else? Is that a good idea? Should we be using password storage? As, I mean, should password storage be done through hashing entirely? And the answer is no. Hashing is not good enough for storing passwords. So we should be using a password algorithm such as argin 2 for example, or PKDF2 or bcrypt, scrypt. These are algorithms that are designed to store passwords, while a simple hashing function, like a one-way function like SHA-512, it's designed for speed and it's designed to designed to obfuscate some kind of information, but it's not been designed to, to be slow. So for when storing passwords, yes, they should be run through a password uh, one-way function, but that function should also be adequately slow. It should have a high enough cost so that when the database is stolen, and, I, and I'm saying when, it's not if, it's, it's when the database is stolen, the user's passwords will take, it will have a very high cost to try to reverse them into their plain text representatives. So these are, of course, what we should be implementing today. However, some companies, they actually implement them with a mistake. By implementing some of these protection mechanisms, such as a password uh, proper password algorithm for storage, we might inadvertently introduce vulnerabilities. And I want to show you guys an example. Just to bring this out of PowerPoint for a second, I want to show you an example where the developers have mistakenly introduced a vulnerability. So the first solution I have here is a simple login.php. If I log in as admin admin, you will see that there's a username vulnerability, um, which user, username vulnerability, uh, sorry, username enumeration vulnerability here, which could be exploited. We can now tell that, hey, there is no such user as admin in this solution because the error message is telling us. And if we went down and said like a, a given username that we might have guessed from somewhere, random password, it actually tells us that this password is wrong. Check your password, all right. So the developer, <clears throat> could be me, could be someone else, but the developer patches this. And as, as he's patching this, he also fixes the password storage solution. So he changes it from storing passwords in MD5, he changes it into storing bcrypt. So if I now try to log in as admin admin here, for example, you will see that it just says login failed. Even if I give it a username that exists, the return will be identical. It will not give us any discrepancy to hold on. But as we were implementing bcrypt as the password storage solution here, in the same patch as removing this user enumeration vulnerability, we might actually have caused a mistake. So let me show you how we can now potentially find this vulnerability by fussing the solution. So right here, I have a little post script, which I'm posting to log into, just like I did before. I'm actually trying to log in with a username down here. So the admin variable is being set down here. And a list of usernames I've basically extracted from LinkedIn. And I also added some usernames here that clearly does not exist in the database. I mean, these could be random strings that should not exist in the various systems. And some of these usernames here might exist. That is where we're going to see if we actually introduce a, a vulnerability or not. So I'm going to click start attack. Just make sure that I have all the settings done correctly here. Looks good. And as I'm clicking start attack, my solution is now slowly but surely trying to log in. One thread at a time, one try at a time, it's trying to log into the target solution. And you can see that the content length is actually identical here. If I go to response to and the render tab, you will see what I saw in my browser. You will see that, hey, it just says login failed. Well, in the previous example, you would see that it says, for example, username does not exist or the password is wrong. But when we implement the decrypt, we might have forgotten about timings. And let's open up the tab, the column called response completed. And let's look at how many milliseconds it takes to complete each different request. And for example, here we have a request of, for example, definitely not a username. And this should not work. John, Eric, Henrik, and, also, and all these, they have a pretty uh, fast uh, response time, I would say. And you have these one down here, which have a much higher cost, much higher 
latency for each request. And I find this funny. I find this discrepancy between these really fast ones versus these slow ones. I find that discrepancy interesting. And this is where the developer made a mistake. In fact, consider what he's actually doing in the backend database. He's probably doing something like this. Select star from users where username equals, for example, our input. All right, and we have sanitized this for SQL injection and so on. So we don't have any vulnerabilities like this. But unless if the user exists, so if, for example, if exists a uh, user, only then should we, yes, I'm having typos here. Who cares about pseudocode, right? If the, ex if the existence of user, then we should select the password from users where username equals so and so, for example. And then we do our little bcrypt on the password and we compare it with the value above here. And this bcrypt here, this is supposed to take time, as I said. This function here takes time. And unless, so if the user does not exist, it just return false, for example, and the solution will respond faster. So in our example here, we can actually see a clear discrepancy with slow requests versus fast requests. And if we have, for example, network congestion, if we have any lag, for example, I can right click some of these, for example, uh, let's go for this one and this one. I can right click these two and say request items again. And we can see how they measure up. So this one had 2,687 now, and this one had 3,800. So there's a clear discrepancies against, uh, discrepancy against a slow and a fast request. And this is actually what is causing a vulnerability. We can now still enumerate usernames because we implemented bcrypt. So we have to be careful of this. And there are actually very popular solutions out there today, such as Skype for Business, which has this exact same vulnerability. They have a timing issue. And I, in, in every pen test we do, we're enumerating what their domain is on their Skype for Business, and we're enumerate, enumerating usernames from their database, uh, from their uh, Active Directory. And that has tremendous value because this allows us to break in. Now that we have a list of legitimate usernames, we can now find users that has a potential weak password. We can find those users in, the, in for example, Active Directory or the database that have, for example, customer support and they had our password reset through customer support, support. And their new password is simply, for example, NetSecurity18. Or maybe it's like, uh, winter 2018. You know these stupid passwords. I know you know them because you probably had one of these passwords one or twice in your career already. So with this, we can now very easily take our attacks and we can configure it to say, hey, let's not just fuss the username field. Let's also fuss the password field where the username field is going to have a list of usernames that exist. So I just basically copy pasted the usernames that had a high cost, a high uh, time taken. And we can now utilize a list of potential passwords. Passwords such as NetSecurity123, Summer 2016, football names, I love some certain word, some certain word forever, for example. Like these are common passwords that we can now try and basically utilize password query. I'm also gonna ramp up this attack and we can see if this is working or not. But I want you to consider, so we're now running, it just said, we're now going to run 266 different logins against party solution. This is going to cause some noise. This is going to cause potentially you getting blocked or potentially you blocking user accounts. It all depends on the target solution. But this is what attackers are doing. They are successful in breaking in because we have users that pick weak passwords such as Tun here with a password of summer 2016. So I'm just going to very quickly go back and say Tun at netsecurity.no is your password to uh, summer 2016. Uh, learn to type, please. Let's see. And yes, it is. And you can imagine the attack surface from here is so much more vulnerable than what we had from the outside. This attack surface, this organization here from the outside looking in is probably a bit robust. It's probably hard to break in. 
but from here, where we have my profile, where we can change password, where we can search and system diagnosis and so on, it's going to be vulnerabilities all over. Most companies are like this. There's some customer, and they have a plethora of different login forms, different logins everywhere. They have VPNs, they have Azure remote desktops open, they have Citrix, they have all these different login pages everywhere, everywhere, and each one of them can be targeted with password guessing. Each one can be tested for social engineering. I can call up the company and say, hey, I just have been blocked out from this solution. I can't remember my username. Can you please help me do a password reset to the password of summer 18, for example? Or send people phishing letters trying to say, for example, we can do typo squatting and register very similar domain names. And we can see if we can fish any of the customers at the target location. So the more login pages you have, those my little 266 request counts here, I can, I can make them be applied. I can take those 266 and I can divide them across all the different solutions the target company have. I don't have to try 266 in a matter of five minutes. No, I can try five on this login page. And then I wait, I try five on this login page and I wait five on this, five on this and five on this. And maybe 30 minutes later, maybe 60 minutes later, maybe 24 hours later, I come back and I do the same thing. Five new passwords on login page one, then another set of five, another set of five, another set of five. Of course, you would have to tune this type of attack in regards of like uh, the user, the list that you, the usernames you're trying and all the users might not be applicable on every single solution, but I'm fairly certain that you get the point. And we might be thinking of things like, uh, how can we block these things? Uh, you might be inclined to block someone on an IP address because you will see my IP address hitting first, the login page one here, login page two and three and so on. But how hard is it really to get yourself a new login page? Uh, sorry, uh, IP address. I mean, you can, you can do some, uh, uh, like you can use Remux, the proxy for, to multiplex your connections through open proxies. You can hire new VPSs. Normally, a motivated attacker will have new IP addresses, no problem whatsoever. And frankly speaking, the last two or three incidents I've had, probably three within the last six months, uh, has been regarding Azure and RDP being logged into by bad guys. So they're brute forcing doing password spraying on Azure usernames and actually just infiltrating them by guessing someone's password. And all the cases I've worked with with Azure being compromised here has been due to ransomware. So they have installed ransomware on the target uh, location. So that's quite bad, remote desktop being utilized. What we would preferably see, what we want to see is having many of the login fields that we're seeing customers have, that they're actually being protected behind a VPN. I mean, I'm actually speaking from experience here. Lots and lots of the login fields from my customers does not have to be exposed to the internet. A lot of them can be filtered behind a VPN. So you have to authenticate with two-factor authentication, for example. I love that. Uh, some solutions, they're going for a single sign-on, and they're like, yeah, we're going to be safe finally. But single sign-on doesn't really help you unless you have two-factor authentication. So you definitely need to have this two-factor authentication uh, available for you. Typically, this single sign-on is like secrets or something else, and you need to have some separate token to protect yourself. And then what I would do for my companies or for my own company, I would accept the risk of having online login solutions for many of my solutions that are, for example, third party or doesn't pose any risk when it comes to like the infrastructure is not on a shared host that is connected in some way to my company, something that has been isolated or outsourced somewhere else. I can leave them without two-factor authentication probably, but I definitely want to have faith for the other things because they expose too much risk in my opinion. So defenses against this, I mean, far from perfect. Let's go through this list. Capture, not good enough. Automatic shunning, well, this could help you, but it also could potentially cost you to um, succumb under denial of service attacks. Say, for example, you do automated shunning on usernames or, or uh, say you automatically block a username that has more than five illegal logins, for example. Well, could I not then take a list of all your users through username enumeration and cause all those users to be blocked from accessing the solution? 
yes, I could. So that's a risk you either have to accept or, or deal with in, a, in another way. Uh, this would be very bad for your company, potentially, if I do a denial of service attack just before you're going to do, say, a press release or just before you're going to have this major release fest or whatever it might be, and all of a sudden none of these were transport, then you have to do instant response, you have to find my IP address, then you have to block my IP address, and I just get a new IP address. And that could be hard to deal with. Ray trotting, I love that, and um, one of the NIST recommendations as well. Strong passwords, of course, that would be in an ideal world. <laughs> ideal world, we would have strong passwords, but it's just not happening. Really great measures are two-factor authentication, even over SMS. Yes, I know, we're all nerds. We know SMS enough, it's not perfect, but listen up, it's 100,000 times better than not having it. Right? So we're trying to make security better, not worse. And adding an SMS-based token, for example, like two-factor authentication, it's not bad. It just could be better. Um, and also passwordless, uh, uh, passwordless authentication with tokens, for example, is a good idea. So I'll talk more about this soon. Capture attack can be defeated in many different ways. Capture, when we see capture, the first thing we try is just try not submit the capture. So we have a login form, for example, some kind of CAPTCHA enabled field, and we try to submit the form without CAPTCHA. And I would say maybe one out of three times it works. There is no CAPTCHA. It just asks you to prove that you're not a robot. And a lot of the times they, they haven't implemented it properly server side. So that's definitely something that's doable. You could potentially find vulnerabilities in CAPTCHA. So depending on what type of vendor you're using, uh, there might be vulnerabilities in it that allows you to bypass. For example, in some cases, the source code might reveal uh, that how the image has been generated, for example, and there might be clues on what is actually rendered on the image, not by reading the image with OCR, but actually finding a vulnerability. Many cases of this, and you will see this, especially when it comes to like uh, small shops that want to do everything themselves. They want to develop every library, everything they developed, they want to do it themselves and you will see that there. OCR is definitely something that is doable. I'll show you a script soon. And also outsourcing, outsourcing uh, it to, to other people. Uh, let me show you how to outsource it. This is taken from a website. You can find this easily if you Google it yourself. But this is a website that will outsource your capture sources. So you will send them a, like a little canvas object or whatever you have of the capture you need to have solved. And there's actually people who will type in the capture for you and feed it back using APIs and, and easy to use. You can also go to fiverr.com and you can search up, let's do that as a simple little exercise here. So fiverr.com and we do a search for capture. And you will see that there's a bunch of capture solving services out here. Like I will add capture. So this is okay. So let's uh, look for, uh, um, I will make capture work. These are people who will make it implemented. You will also see that there are people who will actually type in capture for you here. So I went through over this list earlier today and I saw a bunch of them. I'm sure some of you can see some of them already, but that's kind of, uh, <laughs> kind of interesting outsourcing the capture. OCR, uh, I'm working on some scripts that will do this with JavaScript right now, where I'm using Tesseract and Ocran. So basically, I want to have a user script in GraceMonkey or um, similar plugins to your browser, where you can just right-click an image, and you will use Tesseract and Ocran to see if you can find uh, the values behind that image using OCR, optical character recognition. So that's pretty cool. What about attacking two-factor authentication? Can it be defeated? In many cases, it can. First of all, we should ask ourselves, how many tries do you have to get the correct two-factor authentication type of code? How many correct, uh, sorry, incorrect tries do you have before you're kicked out? And I've seen more times than I would like to see it that they don't have a maximum set boundary. You can try as many times as you want, as long as your session is currently live. And each time you send a session in, you're refreshing, uh, sorry, sending a request in, you're refreshing the session and you can go on forever. So that would be a vulnerability. Um, Facebook had this vulnerability on one of their test servers and it allowed you to bypass two-factor authentication for anyone, even though it was on test. The observation window should also be considered. How long are they observing you for and how many tries do you have each time? Are sessions invalidated? So can, do you have to like type in a new username and password and get a new session? What is the complexity of the factor? Is it a simple 
uh, like four digit pin code or six digit pin code, whatever it is, you might be able to defeat it based on the complexity. You can also consider if the factor can be intercepted, like with SMS, uh, using MC catcher, for example. You could potentially intercept someone's SMS or have a malicious uh, uh, application on the cell phone that can read and intercept SMSs. This would also allow you to, to defeat uh, such mechanisms. But I think the biggest one perhaps is that will work against very many solutions is if it can be social engineered. Trying to call up the user, for example, say you found someone's username and password, you know it's working, but you have a two-factor authentication code that you need to bypass. So find their phone number, call them up and say, hey, this is the IT department calling. We need to verify your security. So we're gonna send the code to your cell phone right now and we need you to read up this uh, code for us so that we can verify the integrity of your account. You might get lucky on this and it will allow you to expand on your attack surface, finding more things to hack. Of course, there's also some solutions that might allow you to change where the token is being delivered. Say with the concept of SMS, you might, and this is from a real case, mind you, uh, but we had an SMS two-factor authentication solution that we were targeting. And in a separate solution, we were allowed to log in without a two-factor authentication. In that solution, we were also allowed to update the user's phone number. And by updating that phone number, it was synchronized back to Active Directory. Uh, we waited 30 minutes, and all of a sudden, we had the two-factor authentication codes being delivered to our own phones instead of to the target end user. So that could be nice. Uh, breaking and entering in 2018, is, is, it, it is more or less like this every time. Uh, users are very often the reason that companies are breaking in. And this is not how we like to break in in a pen test, but this is what happens. There is credential stopping where we have leaked databases, which we go through and we find usernames and passwords, username enumeration, enumeration and password spraying. This almost every time allows us to get in somewhere, just one foot inside of the, uh, inside of the organization. But from here, there is vulnerabilities. From here, we have the command injections. We have SQL injections across site XML entities and so on. These things we find after authentication. And this should beg the question, should a pen test be authenticated or not? Of course it should. You should be testing after the fact that users lose their credentials, unless you have two-factor authentication, of course. Then maybe not, maybe depends on how much uh, money the company wanna throw at you. When it comes to leaked accounts, and this is just our example from Net Security. I mean, we have a, a database with more than 3 billion usernames and passwords, where all the passwords are in clear text. I, if we have 3 billion, I expect motivated attackers like cyber gangs, APT press, and so on, to have at least like many, 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 many more billions than we do of usernames and passwords. So we just collect them off the dark net and from publicly leaked databases and so on. And we collect them so we can show our customers, hey, you have, say, SAS have 90 users in our database where the password is revealed in clear text. You should probably address these usernames so that they have updated passwords across all their services. Uh, for example, when I look for example.com in this uh, ELK database, I get 142K uh, hits. And that's pretty interesting. Unfortunately, most users, they will go like this. Oh, snap, someone figured out my password. Now I have to rename my dog. <laughs> and this is, uh, this is actually kind of like it was when I was hacking a reporter back here in Norway uh, early this year. Uh, they challenged me to hack this reporter from, from Oslo. I'm sitting here in Bergen. And I got into her system through some, uh, some phishing, some fake flash updates, and essentially I got command line access on her system. I did a hash dump, got her all her hashes off her memory, and cracked her passwords. The password was the name of her, her dog, and the password, uh, and the number one, two, three. And this, this, this TV broadcasting uh, customer I was working with, they broadcast this on national TV everywhere, so her password is actually fully, properly leaked online today. Getting a list or generating a list of possible users is not tremendously hard. What we do is basically we go to uh, we go to LinkedIn, and I'll show you. Uh, I'll show you maybe with this one, uh, actually this one, and um, I'm gonna bring over another tab here, and I have a little user script running right now. So I have a JavaScript running inside my browser, so that whenever I visit the following web page, LinkedIn.com, with the fastest current company and so on it will automatically run my JavaScript. And what my JavaScript is doing is basically it scrolls down, so it causes this Ajax to, to repeatedly trigger over and over. 
it clicks the next button. Like, yes, this is literally a scraping script. And it just collects names and titles of all the employees of a target company. So eventually, when I reach the last page here, I will have in my return, in my results, I will have a list of all the users and the respective titles of this target company. So now it's done. I have a list in the bottom here. I take this list of, of uh, potential users and I create usernames with them uh, with a little uh, username py, a little script that we have from one of our employees. And say, for example, for the, for the name Chris, which was in the employee list that we just collected, you will see usernames such as Dale, CHRD, Dale C, and, and all these permutations of possible passwords. And I can use this in my password spraying endeavors. Uh, this script is on LinkedIn, by the way. It's it's a bit buggy. Uh, there is like yeah, there's some <laughs> error checking that needs to be done, and also it might actually go against LinkedIn terms and conditions uh, of scraping their website. So be careful when using these scripts. Other things that we can do when attacking users and login solutions and authentication mechanisms is trying to generate a list of possible passwords. And I love Cup for this, the Common User Password Profiler. This is really nice and has been very helpful when I've been attacking reporters and journalists in my lifetime. I've had like four or five different cases where journalists have challenged me to, hey, Chris, can you just hack my Facebook? And what, I, what I'm doing with this um, tool is that I'm running copper like this and I can specify interactive mode. And I'm saying, what is my target? Well, my target is, for example, Chris, Dale. My nickname is, say, Chris AD. This might be learned through open source intelligence. My birthday is 15th, uh, 1985. My partner's name, I'm not going to go there, so I'm just going to go no reply. Enter, 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 enter. And do I want to add some special words, special characters, so on? Let's just see what happens. No leap mode. Now I can show you the contents of Chris.txt. And I have a list of potential passwords based on my birthday, based on my name, based on my last name, and so on. And check out uh, that we have, uh, let's see, Sir. There we go. I think we have Sir H. Uh, I would like to see the password S I R H C 85, this one without the D A. It will be, it will show further down in my word list here. But the reason I want to see that password is because. If you look through our leak database of 3 billion passwords, when I search for chris.adale at gmail.com, which is my private email, you will see that the password they have for me is sirch85, which is the password I used when I was like 10 years old. So <laughs> that's actually one of my old passwords. Now, I love seeing it because I've forgotten about those times. And I remember one time I forgot my own password and I just, I just couldn't get it right. And the reason is because my Password is not Chris backwards. It's actually the C and H has been replaced and it's swapped and then 85. And I did this as a typo the first time I started using this password. And then when I started trying to figure out what my real password was, I couldn't get it because I kept typing this. And of course, my password was with these flicked around. So quite powerful, very nice to be able to prove to customers why they need to have, for example, two-factor authentication. Uh, and I, I, I essentially, I want customers to, to deal with leaks before we start the pen test. So that in the pen test, we can have uh, focus on the things that really matter, not easy stuff like trying to compromise usernames and credentials. We want to focus on the hard stuff like parsing JavaScript libraries, finding vulnerabilities such like this. However, a modern attacker does not care of how they're breaking in. They're going to be utilizing scanners such as Nmap or Mascan to try to find any type of login, whether it be HTTPS, DNC, or RDP, any type of login. They're going to feed these scan results in, into scanners like Eyewitness or Aquatone, which will give you a screenshot of the given service. And they will map out your entire attack surface when it comes to login fields. Then they're going to extract usernames and passwords from their own leak databases. And we're going to see if these leaks are working. This is called credential stuffing. And it's an immensely powerful technique today. Then they're going to see if they can pivot on employee names. If I have a list of employees, for example, from our output from uh, LinkedIn here, look, I have 40, 40 employees here. 
if I can, maybe I cannot find, uh, for example, uh, you're on at NetSecurity that they know in my lead database, but I can find someone with an email address of Yaron Mielvold, for example, in the, uh, from a Gmail leak or a Hotmail or Yahoo leak. If I can find someone's personal password, very often you will see that it directly correlates to what their corporate password is if it's not identical. And we can use this information then to break in. And the attackers are going to just go slow and steady. They don't have, they, they don't care if it takes a week, if it takes a month, or if it takes six months. They're just slow and steady, making sure that they can break in. So we do this in our recon phase. We target, for example, developers. So in this is a screenshot, the, the little uh, green, yellow, red listing here and white listing is from our reconnaissance process, where we're targeting, say, for example, IT developers, IT operations, and similar people in the organization. And we're trying to see, do they have any Stack Overflow questions? Do they have a GitHub or a Bitbucket repository containing uh, source code that might be interesting, or maybe revisions in a source code that might be interesting? And you will see that in, in some cases, we actually find developers who are leaking information online, whether it be usernames or passwords, it might just be confidential information regarding uh, configurations and so on. And the black screenshot you're seeing here from IBM Connections, this is actually from a real case we had where we did reconnaissance. If you look at the password which has been masked here, the password was masked exactly like this. And all we did to break into this client is that we fired up cmd.exe and we took that password. Look at the, notice the pixels on the bottom here and the top pixels in the back here. And we went through every character that might produce something like this. And we said X, 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 X. And we had then four potential wildcards where we did not know which part of the password this was from. And basically, from a recon, we sent them a list, an Excel spreadsheet with uh, about uh, 500 usernames, uh, sorry, passwords. And we said, is your password one of these? And they said, yes, it is. So they could fix that problem before it became an issue, and we could focus on more important stuff in, in our pen tests. So what about us? Unique and strong passwords across all, across all services. <laughs> that's, that's what we preach. How do we practice it? Well, we practice it, of course, using password managers, and we should be practicing what we preach. I have more than a thousand ac accounts everywhere they, they, I have like literally more than 1,000 usernames and passwords combinations across the entire internet and across customers and so on. And I have a unique password across every single device. I have to remember my username uh, and password for my laptop and to open my database. But other than that, I don't really deal with passwords anymore. I just store them inside of Heapus. Is it a perfect solution? Of course it's not, but it is really, really good. Say for example, I wanted to log into Facebook right now. I could bring up facebook.com. I would simply go to my key pass. I would search for Facebook. This is my live one, mind you. I would click Control D on the Facebook entry, and it just simply auto types my password into the field here. And all of a sudden, it says two factor authentication required. It should really be that simple. I mean, two factor, even though you have my password now, I can simply use two factor authentication to protect myself. And you would have to be a very motivated attacker to defeat this concept. I'm not ashamed of my password. It looks like this. So yes, if you're recording right now, I have to change my password soon. But you still have to change my steal my phone and so on. This is kind of a nutty thing to do, I would say. So let's just move on and hurry up and then this presentation so I can change my password. But yeah, that was my password. So it should be that simple, guys. It's easy to use two factor authentication. And we should change two-factor authentication so it's not the nightmare that we are used to. Normal two-factor authentication will kick you out and ask for a code every 30 minutes, for example. We should not do it like this. Facebook, for example, or Duo Security or any other uh, modern two-factor implementation, they will have positive indicators and negative indicators, and they will only challenge you with a two-factor authentication code if you have enough points, so to speak. So I'm doing uh, air, air quotes here, but, but if you have enough positive indicators that they know who you are, based on, for example, browser profile, that you're coming from a geolocation where we know you know where you're coming from, and so on, 
then if you have enough of those positive indicators, well, only then are we going to challenge you again with two uh, Then we're not going to challenge you again with two factor authentication. But say, for example, you're all of a sudden your, your browser goes back in time when it comes to patching, and all of a sudden you're trying to log in from, uh, from China, Russia, or the US, for example, and all of the time you've been coming from Norway. Well, that could lead you with a negative score, and we can then send you with a, a challenge for your next login. When it comes to 2FA, I've always wondered why not more companies are implementing it. Because it's not tremendously hard to get there. It's that many users hate it. And based on uh, President Ackerman's the GIAC gold paper here, we can see that when it, looks, when it comes to preferred form of two-factor authentication, most users actually prefer SMS. And second to the highest is actually email when it comes to getting your two-factor authentication being delivered, your code. I don't like that. I like the Google, Google prompt, for example, like a push notification. And on the left side here, we can see some data regarding what people consider is important with two vector and if they're going to implement it and so on. Uh, if you look at NIST uh, recommendations on how to do authentication, we can see that they have some solid verifications or solid recommendations here. For example, the verifier shall limit consecutive failed authentication attempts on a single account no more than 100. Well, that's pretty nice. Then we could block the IP or the user. We should have CAPTCHA. Uh, oops. We should have CAPTCHA. We should require to wait after failed attempts for a period of time that increases as the user account approaches the maximum allowance. That is very nice. They say that we could whitelist who is allowed to authenticate to our solutions. That is pretty awesome. I love whitelisting. I say put it behind your VPN, put it behind a two-factor authentication solution somewhere else and just have it being reverse proxy behind that. I love that. And you can also say that uh, once you have someone uh, successfully logging in, uh, oh, sorry, you can use a UBA here, for example, user behavior analytics to discover if there's something fishy going on. And also when someone successfully authenticates, yes, let's then disregard any previous tail ones. I like these recommendations, they're pretty cool. And they're taken from this special publication on the topic of, uh, of matter. Other things that I have when it comes to helping organizations is I have, for example, this script from, uh, which is on GitHub on this link. This script will basically dump credentials of Active Directory without using any hacker tool whatsoever. We're using PowerShell and we're running uh, PowerShell uh, DS internals PowerShell module for dumping hashes of a target Active Directory domain controller using only uh, credentials of a domain admin or the replicate Active Directory uh, permission. So you don't have to install mini cats. You don't have to install any password dumping tools. You need PowerShell and credentials, and you can go download all your hashes and see does any of the hashes of my user accounts have a known weak hash? And you can start to create permutations. So you can start to say, hey, uh, based on the name of the company, based on the month and the days of the week and so on, we can create these known bad hashes and we can make sure that the organization does not have any of those weak ones in our organization. This script is more like a proof of concept. It's not properly developed yet. But the idea here is to, first of all, the known bad array here, populate this more dynamically and also based on order lists, and also automatically do a reset password and send the user an email with in the attachment or uh, a little reminder of the password policy of the company. So the thing is, we should not call it passwords. Of course, everyone's seen the XKCD here, right? Where we have where, where we see that length trumps complexity in so many dimensions. Like it's easier to remember a long password than it is to remember a short and complex password. And that long password is more secure. We should also move into two-factor authentication and passwordless authentication poten potentially. This is where Windows is going today. Google is probably going the same route. And when it comes to, uh, for example, passwordless authentication and two-factor, uh, when we give out, out our secrets like fingerprint data, like uh, iris scans or face scans and so on, our privacy keys should only be shared with the authenticator, the device that we are having in our possession. We need to be very careful that we do not share this information with someone else. I want to show you something else. Like I'm, I'm on my final slides here. Here we have Ubicos with their little new web auth uh, demo thing here. So I'm going to register a username and I'm just going to go with uh, Chris uh, and name my authenticator tests. I'm not going to specify a password. I'm going to click next. And then I'm being, pro, uh, being asked to insert my authenticator. And I insert my YubiKey. 
and I clicked the button on my YubiKey. And of course, registration timed out. So let's go back to register here. Come on, come on. So one more time, Chris, tests. We can now do next. And I can now register to the solution with my YubiKey. I allow it in my browser. And now it says verify device. We can now try to log in. Use the name of Chris. I don't have to specify a password. All I need is a dongle of some sort like a YubiKey and I've authenticated successfully. And this is fairly strong. This is something that will allow people in hard hats and coveralls to do proper security without having a hassle. I mean, you're bringing with you your keys. And if you can bring with you your keys, I'm pretty sure you can bring with you a uh, Yubico or uh, uh, like a Google Tanium, uh, uh, Titanium, I forgot the name of them, but it shouldn't be that hard. So bottom, bottom line, I would say is that, look, the attackers will always have one foot inside of your organization. They have breached your DMZ. They are inside of your software as a service, and you should still be secure. Things that we can talk about today that deserves their own talk, access tokens like the Facebook hack, for example, signing authorization of requests, Java web tokens, Auth0, ADFS, federation systems, and so on, and also inside abuse of passwords and, and doing password spraying on the inside. And that, folks, was 45 minutes. I hope it was interesting. I hope I, I'm very happy to be able to have this channel to get thoughts out of my head and share them with you. And hopefully you have feedback. Hopefully you have uh, recommendations on a new web talk, and maybe this has inspired you to create your own web talks and webcasts even, and, and just share with the community what we find to be working and where we need to improve. Carol and Jason. Hey, thank you very much for that. Uh, we already have a few questions for everyone that's listening. Feel free to submit more questions, or I also have a request. If you have ideas for future webcasts, please go ahead and type them into the questions window, and we will use those uh, to generate new webcasts. Uh, so the first question here, Chris, is please explain observation window again. Oh, yeah. So the observation window is basically how many cries you have before, before the solution forgets all about your previous login attempts. So say, for example, the observation window is 30 minutes. You might say that within 30 minutes, if you have more than five illegal logins, we're going to block you by, based on IP address or based on the username. So that's what I'm talking about. Guess what? I'm actually changing my password right now. <laughs> yes. All right, so uh, next question from Jeremy. Of these four recommended hash algorithms, please advise which of these are supported well in both Java and ASP.NET. The four mentioned were bcrypt, uh, pbf, df2, scrypt, argon2. All right. Uh, unfortunately, it's been like uh, quite a while since I was a developer. So I, I honestly don't know which one is best supported, but I know Argon2 just won a prize uh, on being the best type of key derivative function for password storage. And I know that one should have a good support. For example, uh, my KeyPass database is, is, has Argon2 supported with it. I've also seen in .NET and also in Java, PBKDF2, I've been implemented both of, uh, in both of those languages. I've helped implement PBKDF2. Uh, in PHP, I've been using Decrypt, but I, honestly, I don't know how well they're supported across the different environments and development uh, languages. Sorry. Uh, next question. Would you suggest PAM tech to help manage and rotate passwords? Password. Uh, uh, what uh, solution was that? Uh, would you suggest PAM tech? I believe that's password management tech to help manage and rotate passwords. Aha, uh -huh. password manager. Oh, definitely. Look, I have I have blogs on why you should be using a password manager, how to circumvent and avoid the most common pitfalls. I've been using KeyPass. This is my per this is my per personal preference for my personal use and also for organizational use for uh, more than seven years now. I've never had a single problem that I've not been able to solve, whether it being me deep underneath the ground where there's no cell phone reception, no internet whatsoever, and I'm on a console access on a laptop or, sorry, on a server, and I still need to have access to my database. I've gotten those things to work. Uh, for example, with RDP, in many cases, you cannot paste passwords into RDP. Say when changing your password or entering a new password, you're not allowed to paste, but using the auto-typing, we kind of defeat that. Uh, it's, it's not a perfect solution. We're not aiming for perfect solutions. We have to remember that we're, we're trying to get to where security is good enough. Of course, someone can steal my database, 
but you're still going to have to work through uh, argon 2, a cost of like uh, 2,800 cost of argon 2, which on a modern laptop like this takes about five seconds to decrypt the database. And if I get infected with malware, yes, they have in-memory access to my database as long as it's in unlocked. But every time I lock my PC, my database is also locked. I only lock it when I need to use it. And I'm, ac I'm accepting that risk. I'm, I'm in a better place with a password manager than without it. So it's even the corporate co policy now at NetSecurity that every single employee, salesperson alike, anyone, you have to use a password manager. You're not allowed to remember passwords anymore. That's one of the things that we're implementing. And it's going great. By the way, I have changed my fast Facebook password, so you can try hacking me now. You, you can stop trying to hack me now. <laughs> uh, I feel like that's another challenge, Chris. Um, what are your thoughts about, and I feel like this might be an entire uh, webcast on its own, but if you have any quick thoughts on what are your thoughts about using biometrics, uh, finger palm prints, what kind of attacks are you seeing against biometric systems, and what are your recommendations for biometric attack countermeasures? So, so I love biometrics uh, as long as being as long as it's implemented properly. I mean, there are some false positives. There are some. There's been many practical attacks, like printing out the face of someone and putting like a lens on top of someone's eyes, and all of a sudden you fooled, like say the camera detection of someone's face. But, but I mean, we need to look at solutions that that work for certain people in organization. Say those people in organization that they will never have a long password. They just need to have something that is secure enough that works. And for those things, biometrics could be very good. Also, biometrics in accordance with a password is, of course, very nice. But biometrics alone can be very, very useful, like with Windows Hello, for example. But we got to be super careful when we implement these protocols. We got to be careful that we never share our private key, which is then our thumbprint or our iris. This information should never be shared with the target destination. It should not be stored in a database. This is what happened with uh, the US. You guys had a major data leak uh, compromising uh, like CIA agents and a lot of staff uh, for government staff. The database of fingerprints was compromised. And that database were not, it was not supposed to store fingerprints in a database. They should have just stored like a derivation from what the fingerprint can produce, like in a public, uh, a public key, private key type of scenario. That's what we should implement, but unfortunately, they didn't. Uh, but yeah, definitely a webcast uh, on, on biometrics would be awesome. There's been a lot of research on there, especially from the KS Computing Club over in Germany. They had some fantastic bypasses on attacks on biometrics. One attack I remember where they were using a gummy bear as a fingerprint copier. So they were copying fingerprints onto a gummy bear and they were like swiping it across a fingerprint sensor, uh, successfully breaking into someone's laptop just by observing someone's fingerprint of a, of a glass, I think it was. <laughs> uh, next question. Uh, is SMS hacking very common? If so, is it primary from hijacking an account and changing a SIM? I didn't get the second part of that question. Uh, if, if SMS hacking is very common, uh, is it primary from hijacking an account and changing a phone SIM? I believe it's Phone, soon. phone. All right. All right. So let me try to interpret it in the way I understand it. Is SMS hijacking uh, pop uh, like very common? I I would say yes and no. It's not something that we can use in engagements because we're we're actually barred from doing it by the federal uh, authority for like signals and stuff. Like we are not allowed to broadcast our own uh, MC cachers, for example. But just last year and the year before, we see tons and tons of fake base stations around prominent areas in the Oslo area, around our government buildings. There are fake base stations that we're trying to track down and figure out who's deploying them and what they're doing and what type of data they're collecting. And they could definitely be used for intercepting SMS and intercepting uh, uh, SMS codes. But you would have to be like a high profile target, I would say. I would not expect uh, like random cyber criminals yet to have those capabilities. But uh, yeah, who knows what will happen, right? So I noticed that every time I travel, I keep getting more and more spam on my phones. And that's probably because my phone has registered, uh, registered to a fake base station and given up uh, information about my phone number and so on. 
and I'm getting more and more spam every time I travel abroad. So we might see that this, this could potentially change in the future and SMS is being defeated. Uh, what are your thoughts on Yubico for Windows authentication? Uh, I find Yubico to be uh, quite robust, quite nice. Uh, uh, I have not tried it myself, unfortunately. So I'm currently using my fingerprint and a password to log in. But um, I would say go for it. It's probably going to improve your security rather than defeat it. I'm using, I was using a Yubico myself for uh, the, the web authentication. Authentication, and I've been looking at using just Yubico for other stuff as well. But currently, I'm just using for proof of concept and setting up authentication solutions and seeing if we can break them. And then I got a couple questions here that I'm going to combine together for one. Uh, why KeyPass? What about solutions like LastPass or Dashlane? Right. Uh, I get that question quite a lot. <laughs> uh, the thing is. Uh, I cannot have my passwords in the browser. So I've never used LastPass, but I understand that it's actually in the browser. And a lot of the, my inputs are actually over SSH or via RDP, for example, where I cannot paste. I have to type it. And KeePass is just nice for that. And also, I synchronize my KeePass database. So I'm, I'm synchronizing across all my databases using a cloud service. So I will have an offline version of the database on my phone. So if I leave, for example, to a place where I cannot go online, I still have my password with me. And I can take the database. I have a physical copy in a safe in my host. So I have the database in a copy. I also have the password for the database written down in a secure place. So in case I get hit in the head by a wrench, I will still be able to open up the database and get my life back. You know. But uh, it just, it's just a matter of preference. When it comes to my corporate policy in that security, this has been decided without too much of me uh, uh, involving myself because I'm very biased. But they decided that minimum, you should be using LastPass. But if you're a technician and we need to store uh, credentials for customers, you're going to use KeePass so that we can put it on our uh, maintenance, uh, maintenance service or uh, on our secure file share, so to speak. And uh, we can have multi-user access to them, and we can store them in a secure manner. And LastPass also does this, so to speak, but it's in the cloud, and we kind of like we want to keep everything contained within Norway, within an environment that we trust to the fullest. So it's just preferences. So a comment for everyone currently listening: uh, in about two days or so, and this is not for the recording, but people listening live, in about two days you'll receive an email from me, Jason at Sands. And uh, there, if you have any other questions, anything that you thought of, uh, feel free to ask it then. Any other comments, feel free to, to, to give me those, and I will forward them on to Chris, and he will answer them when he has a chance to get to them. Um, Thank you. Yep. Uh, last question I think we'll have time for today. What password managers are recommended for use on mobile devices? So I'm, I'm still using KeePass on my mobile phone, and I'm using the tool, the, the KeePass parser called KeePass Droid. Uh, but again, this is going to be very subjective. It's going to be uh, based on what I feel like I feel and what I like. Uh, what is the most secure? Uh, I, th I feel that this this thing that we ask ourselves, what is the most secure? It keeps changing all the time. Like who is the best next generation firewall vendor? Who is the best so and so? And it's not necessarily who is best. It's just who has timely updates, who has active development, who takes security uh, seriously. And I would just go with a vendor that you feel like you can trust. You are going to get hacked, though. So it's not a perfect solution. And we should stop working for those things. <laughs> uh, so if anyone has any comments uh, remaining, feel free to go ahead and post those in the questions, or if you have suggestions for future webcasts. Uh, last thing, Chris, is where are you teaching next for Sands? Oh, yeah. Uh, I have like maybe one or two slots open in Dublin. In, I'm, I'm leaving on Sunday, so we start class on Monday. Uh, but that class is more or less full. Uh, you might be lucky to get a slot or two. Then I have a private engagement in January, so I won't be teaching in a public space. Uh, but back in February, I'm open in London. And uh, you can sign up for my classes in London in February. And in March, uh, sorry, April, I'm in Muscat, Oman, and also in, in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. So if you want to uh, go to an exotic country, <laughs> join me. But yeah, yeah, those places are pretty awesome. And anyone listening right now or listen to the recording, you can go to uh, do a Google search for Sands and Chris Dale, and it will bring up every place that he's teaching next. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm also posting it on my Twitter accounts here and there. If you follow me on Twitter, you will see some of my updates. And I'm also asking for help on some of the repositories that I'm working on. There's some great ideas out there that um, I'm probably not going to finish on my own. But if you want to contribute, uh, hit me up. All right, Chris. Um, any final words today? No, thank you all for listening. I'm, I'm happy to see so many people joined, and uh, hopefully it was uh, useful and interesting to see. And uh, Hit me up on Twitter and let me know what you thought. All right. Thank you, uh, Carol. It is over to you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast. Woo.